Hey, this is Katie and Catherine, and we're here to give you the 411K. Cheers! This week, we got together with Helene Olin, a blogger for Washington Post Opinions. She's the author of Pound Foolish, Exposing the Dark Side of the Personal Finance Industry, and co-author with Harold Pollack of The Index Card, Why Personal Finance Doesn't Have to be Complicated. The original index card contained nine personal finance tips. And in this episode, we dived into a few a bit deeper and also got Helene's view on the macro impacts on personal finance. We are just so delighted to have the co-author of the index card here. This is something that Katie uh, introduced to me, I think about three or six months ago. And it's just so common sense and simple and straightforward for those of us who are, you know, really overwhelmed and don't know what to do. One of the questions that we wanted to kick things off with today, and it's what is it about saving that is so difficult for people? There's two things going on, right? I mean, first, we're very present oriented. I mean, that's just we're human beings, right? You're, you know, we're wired to get the next meal. I mean, that's what we're here for, right? Thinking about long term goals is not necessarily a, you know, something that comes instinctively to us. But I think second, and, and this is a bigger point here, and it, it gets lost a lot in the index card, truthfully, when people just read it casually. It's that you know, the United States had a savings rate of 10% in 1980. We didn't become absolute idiots over the first, over the next, you know, 30, 40 years. Is it that things got much harder on people? Even people are kind of overwhelmed with daily expenses, frankly. You know, rent, housing, education, medical has become a much huger part of people's budget and it takes up much bit bigger space. So that makes also makes it much more difficult because you're saving from a smaller pie as salary stagnated. So you're then dealing with, you know, this sort of collision of, on one hand, we're wired to get through the next day, combined with the fact that it's actually harder than it used to be to put that money aside. Actually, I had spoken with a financial advisor in the last couple of weeks who was saying that the majority of Americans actually actually use 50% of their take-home pay on things like rent, groceries, things that you actually need to spend money on on a month to month or week. It's closer to right. 65% to be. And then it leaves very little room for saving. Right. And, and, you know, and I would say the other part of this is, is we do live in a society where, you know, to be blunt, the buying stuff and spending money is just kind of pitched to people nonstop. And on one level, you know, you almost have to be superhuman to resist it. You know, it, it's really easy to tell people, oh, you know, just resist, right? Resist. You know, how often do you resist, really? And I think that's another piece of this, too. I mean, our whole society is predicated on people spending money. You know, consumers make up the largest part of our economy at roughly 70 percent. This wasn't an accident. It was a very deliberate strategy on the part of our government. It's something that is has to be factored in here as well. I mean, that's part of what makes our economy run. It's 70 percent of our economy, roughly. The number varies a little bit, right, is consumer spending. This was a deliberate strategy after Russian in World War II to keep our economy prosperous so we would not go back to the way we were before. Whether, you know, it was a sea change in how we lived You know, I can tell you, though, that both of my grandmothers simply did not have stuff the way we all have stuff because they never acquired the habit because this change didn't really happen to them till they were well into their 30s or even into their 40s. It was a totally different world. And one of the things that happens when when change like that occurs, I always say really successful social change, and I'm using the word successful loosely here because this probably wasn't such a great thing in many ways, right? Is that we actually forget what it was like before. I spent my time as a child in both of my grandparents' apartments, and I can tell you they didn't have a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, mm. Just, and nope, neither did anybody else ever their age. I mean, it was just, they just didn't do it. And is there anything that you took from them or that you try to do in your day-to-day life to resist that spending I yourself? I have a huge problem with spending, I, by, by which I mean I don't judge it. Because I, I don't. I don't like this Puritan attitude towards it. There's this kind of myth out there that really wealthy people don't spend money. 
I live in New York City. I and I'm <laughs> in college, okay? I can tell you this is absolute BS, okay? Wealthy people spend a lot of money. They go to restaurants, they bribe their children's way into schools. I mean, <laughs> they do all sorts of stuff with their money, okay? <laughs> so I don't like doing that play game. The the thing I found that I did when I started thinking more about money is that I try to be more mindful of it. And by mindful of it, I mean, you know, what am I going to get enjoyment out of it? And what am I not? And I took my younger son to the theater last week. And the theater is at the Park Avenue Armory, which is the Upper East Side. My, my almost 16-year-old is like, can we go out to dinner? Can we go out to dinner? And I looked at him and I said, let me put it to you this way. The restaurants on the Upper East Side are not the stuff you and I like. And they're really expensive. So if we go out to dinner before the theater... We're just not going to go to Rosa Mexicano the next time we're over by Lincoln Center. Uh, <laughs> she happens to love, by the way. And because we will have spent all our money on a mediocre, overpriced food uh, and uh, versus something you and I both want, i.e. the guacamole that they make at the table at Rosa Mexicano. <laughs> and he said, oh, OK, I get that. Couldn't Do agree more. You always splurge for the handmade guacamole. <laughs> <laughs> by the way. Like the day somebody told me about avocado toast. This avocado toast thing. This is amazing. (laughs) So, you know, life is about enjoyment, too. I mean, people deserve to enjoy their lives. And, you know, buying things is part of, you know, life. And I think one of the things that has happened, and I do think some of the demonization of buying stuff is related to this, which is that stuff has actually, over the past 20, 25 years, gotten much cheaper in relative terms, thanks to the surge of, you know, low cost imports coming in from Asia. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm not getting into whether that's a good or bad thing. You can, that's a political discussion, right? The result is, is that I think it's very easy to demonize buying stuff now because anybody can do it. So then when you're using money to express who you are and how you are and what sort of person you are, buying stuff is not unique anymore. It's just something anybody can do. So suddenly the, it moves up in, per, in a perfect for Thorsten Veblen um, description, and it becomes about something else. So it becomes about, you know, instead of a $200 handbag or a $50 handbag, it then becomes about a $1,500 handbag. And at the same time, it becomes more about experiences because, of course, experiences cost more money and they're harder to get your hands on. So it becomes more about travel and more about dining out and so on down the line. I really love that you had that moment where you explained to your son, we could do this now or we could do something that we actually enjoy later. And I think that's something that not a lot of families or even just friends talk about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why do you think people have such a hard time having those conversations? Well, I think money is a huge tension point and people don't, aren't very honest about it in our society. You know, it's the old cliche, right? You know, ask somebody about their sex life and they'll blab off to you and ask them how much they earn. And it's like, did you strip naked in Times Square? I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what, it's terrifying, right? Um, exactly. And I do think that's almost just conditioning to not discuss it that way. And I, I really do think that that is part of it. The second is, is in our society, we tend to have a massive puritanical, you know, we we combine a weird luxurious streak with a weird puritanical streak. I don't think we're very much at a 50% line at any point on this sort of stuff. And so I think people tend to veer from one to the other. So it's suddenly, oh, I can afford, you know, the $7,000 vacation, but, you know, the latte is an indulgence. And I, and I think that leads to a lot, a lack of discussion and a lack of honesty about it. You know, sort of combine all this, we're judging people for how they're spending, we're judging them for what they're earning, we're judging them if they need government help to get by, we're judging them if they've inherited money. I, I mean, you name it, we're kind of judging. Combined with just this fundamental lack of honesty about money in our culture to begin with, it tends to just dampen those sorts of conversations. I mean, and I guess the third part is, is I guess you have to be pretty secure talking about money to have those conversations. Exactly where I was going next with my with my upcoming question. I get the sense that a lot of people are uncomfortable talking about it because they actually don't feel like they have a good handle 
on their finances. Easy when you're fit and you're in shape to give your friend advice on how they could stand to lose five pounds or what strategies they could do to implement to lose some weight. But when you're actually maybe just keeping up with the Joneses or living paycheck to paycheck and don't really have a good emergency fund buffer or haven't been saving for retirement, part part of that may be that people aren't comfortable talking about it. Yeah, I, I think it goes deeper than that. I mean, we live in a society where it's just frowned upon to talk about, frankly. Mm. I, I mean, it, you, whether you have enough or you don't have enough or you have control of it or you don't have control of it is almost a secondary point to this. Mm. It, it's really kind of a, a situation where, I mean, and, you know, there are workplaces where you're not supposed to do this, but it will happen, where you can be fired for talking about your salary. This is illegal. You're, you shouldn't do it, but it happens. I mean, you know, women are underpaid relative to men, sometimes by fairly horrific amounts. Again, we don't talk about it. I write about taxes a lot. But the fact is, is there are countries where actually this is public information, okay? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. There are countries in Scandinavia where you can go down and request some of these tax returns and you get your hands on them, which is horrifying to us, right? Mm -hmm. But to Mm -hmm. them, it's like, no, this is how you ensure it equals society. And by the way, it's probably also how you ensure a lot of people not playing tax games because Mm -hmm. people aren't going to do that if they think their neighbor can go see their tax return. We have a society that the the whole structure of it sort of is secret. And so, you know, switching to philosophy for a minute here, you know, thinking about the way the American society is structured and our, quite frankly, I mean, to be very blunt, our lack of social kind of cushion and buffer, particularly in social health care programs. You know, we've we've seen you write and, and talk about the emergency fund being a, a top saving priority. Why is that? Obviously, because if you don't have one, you're going to be up a creek, right? There's always an emergency. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, last year I went away on vacation and my dog toppled over with with a benign tumor in her in her ear. And I ended up with a several thousand dollar vet bill overnight. But there's always something, right? Then you think, oh, the next month this won't be you know, nothing. Well, the dog's better now, right? What could happen? And then, you know, boom, wait, wait a second. You know, the um, the sink broke. Yeah, my, my fridge broke last week. So I'm just in that camp for sure. Right. There was another $1,000. If you don't have an emergency fund or you don't have the funds in your account in some way, right, to pay for that, you're going to have a problem on your hand. That's why if I had my way, I mean, there would be emergency accounts funded through work the way you fund a 401k. I think Mm. it's actually more important to fund a savings account first. And to be fair, you you could simply arrange to have money taken out of your check to go to your savings account. But I guarantee you that more people would do it if it happened automatically at work the way a 401k happened. Do you think there would be room for that to be rolled out in any company or organization? Yeah, it's a legal issue right now. It's it's called a sidecar account is what they call it. And Mm -hmm. there seems to be some back and forth over whether a company is fully legally protected in doing it should something go wrong. So there's various plans floating around Congress to make it clear that, yes, you can do this, but you probably can do it now. Especially, you know, for big emergencies, like, you know, if you need to buy a new fridge or if you need to, you know, pay for medical bills that you weren't necessarily paying for. And that gets into healthcare and insurance and a whole different thing. But the government was shut down earlier this year. And you see every single headline every day was like Americans can't, aren't even prepared for a $500 emergency without selling something or getting money or help from a friend or family member. So it, it's just crazy that that is something that's not really top of mind. To be fair, I mean, you had several hundred thousand people losing their paycheck overnight. They, in total, right? It wasn't a thousand dollar emergency. People were going to be in crisis pretty quickly. I mean, you know, most people pay their rent check out of their paycheck. Absolutely. Right. So the timing of it was not exactly ideal, shall we say. For millennials who now live by the 280 character tweet, what would you say millennials should be focusing on for their personal finance? Um, vote so that the social fi- social welfare system is beefed up so you're not spending insane amounts of money on health care and then student loan issues. I mean, millennials are having massive student loan issues at this point. Um, public service forgiveness is, you know, not, which was promised to tens of thousands of people, is not being delivered. Um, this has to stop. That's probably not what you were expecting me to say. 
<laughs> I wasn't, but I actually love the answer. The answer is actually fix the system versus some stop using a credit card or something like that. You bring a super macro view uh, to to this issue. I mean, and I would say, you know, on a lower level, I mean, if you want to cut back on spending, use cash. People spend a ton less money when they use cash. It's not just a credit card. I mean, don't use a debit card. Don't use a prepaid card. And I realize that's kind of getting increasingly harder at our society. Don't put your computer, don't put your credit cards automatically on your computer on shopping sites. Something I, a rule I violate all the time, by the way, but it's a good rule. The more you spend cash, the less you use any form of um, plastic, whether real plastic or virtual plastic. You will spend less money. There is no question in my mind of that. Every bit of science we have, every bit of behavioral science we have says that because we don't view it as money when we're spending it if it's not actual coins and paper dollar bills in our hands. You know, our generation and the next digital native generation is going to be using payment platforms on their phones, right? Like we already do with Venmo. I mean, you know, so again, it's always this sort of system that's set up to scold you for not you're overspending, but in fact, every which way possible, it's set up for you to overspend. I also think that's interesting, not just from a generational perspective, but even from just a gender perspective, because I absolutely hate carrying cash for the opposite reason. Like, I think carrying cash feels more like play money to me, where I'm like, oh, yeah, well, I already have this in my wallet, so might as well (laughs) throw this out versus actually seeing numbers in my bank account. And I feel like with a lot of my friends and family, men typically carry cash more than women. My husband, who tends to be more disciplined spender than I am, tends to be a more cash-oriented person than I am, too. I do think there's something to simply having cash on you. Um, Whether it's a sex-based thing or not, I don't know the answer. Um, What I can tell you, however, is that women spend less per day than men, which nobody ever believes, but is absolutely true. Really? Of course they do. They earn less money. How do they not spend less per day? (laughs) Do you know, is it a drastic number? Because that's actually interesting because in totality, women tend to spend more than men. No, they don't. In totality, they spend less than men. Really? They spend more over the course of their lifetime because they live longer. Right. Mm. Sick, and they have more responsibilities for children and elderly relatives. But in terms of spending on themselves on a day-to-day basis, absolutely not. Men outspend women. The difference is, is we judge what women are spending more than men, right? So men spend on computers and everybody goes, boy, you know, you're spending on, you know, an Apple. Women spend on, you know, buying clothes for their kids and they're being frivolous. But the fact of the matter is, is women spend less than men on a daily basis. People are always stunned when they find that out. Yeah, that's certainly a disconnect, right? We're earning right now 82% for every dollar that men earn, and yet we're outspending them on other people over the course of our lifetime. And women products typically are 13% higher than men's products if you're buying a gendered product. And I would love to know your personal opinion um, and from a macro level. Do you think debt is good? Is there good debt? Debt is horrible. Debt traps you. Of course there's good debt because most of us are not going to buy say, a home without debt, right? I mean, you know, debt, you can leverage debt to make money, right? Donald Trump's been doing this his whole life. So on one hand, debt can be very good. But on the other hand, it can trap people too, right? Even a house, which is generally a good thing, can ultimately trap you. If the house is underwater, you can't move or it's harder to move. Credit card debt is always bad. Um, obviously, a lot of people have it and sometimes they have it for good reasons, but it's not good debt and there's no way to make it good debt. Um, student loan debt is not particularly good debt. I mean, it's better than the alternative, which is not going to college at all, right? But if you have student loan debt and you don't graduate from college, you're actually in a worse position than somebody who didn't go to college at all and therefore doesn't have the debt. This is absolutely true. You are also, frankly, worse off than somebody who went to college and didn't need to take the debt because their parents paid the bill. They won the lottery and they write, but who pays the bill, right, if they don't? Down to the fact that people who have student debt have less in retirement savings by their early to mid 30s, less likely to own a home. If they're women, they're less likely to be married. Interestingly, not true for men. Even good debt comes with a big caveat. The book ranks debt as far as good to bad, but I think you're completely right where on one level, debt is bad across the board, but yet you need it to do some things like get a mortgage. So it's a it's a balance, but also acknowledging that you don't necessarily need a credit card at any time. <laughs> yeah, that, that is not debt you should have. But, you know, that being said, it happens. I mean, if you have a real medical crisis, the chances are good you're going to run up some real credit card debt. 
you know, a huge number of bankruptcies are related to medical debt. There's no question about that. But what, what do you think are ways of insuring yourself or protecting yourself from, from those medical, you know, those big ticket, big dollar item medical debts that can very quickly hit you and pile up? I leave the United States would be a really good way to start. I don't know if it's really fully possible unless you're upper middle class. I mean, that's just the reality of it. If you're earning $50,000 a year, you're not protecting yourself against a surprise $25,000 bail. I mean, if you have $25,000 laying around in an emergency account, you know, you got to start questioning what you're up to. You're not protecting yourself against some massive expense like that. You just can't. I mean, it's almost impossible. What you can protect yourself against are, you know, smaller expenses like the sink breaking down, the dog getting sick, having to fly to your best friend's wedding because she's being, you know, she's having a destination wedding in Puerto Vallarta. That sort of stuff you can protect yourself from. Yeah. So I'm hearing a lot on, you know, some of the habits and behaviors and, you know, recognizing the difference between what a real emergency is and what's just an unplanned expense. Get aside three months living expenses. You'll help yourself a lot if you've lost a job. But presumably if you're a millennial and you've lost a job, this is not going to be a long term crisis. And you're not a 55 year old experiencing massive age discrimination, for example. The 55 year olds just going to flat out have a harder time saving up enough money to protect themselves against that. Do, would your advice be different for a millennial versus a middle and older aged person when it comes to how much they should be putting aside and how they should be setting it up and protecting themselves? It's more that somebody who's middle aged needs to start really worrying about retirement. What we know and what we know right now is that the vast majority of people over the age of 50 will be involuntarily separated from the workforce. There's this kind of idea out there that, you know, you don't have to save for retirement as much as everybody says you do because, you know, we could all work till we drop. Basically, this has turned out to be one of the great myths of our time. Unfortunately, it would be nice if it was true, but not just for financial reasons, but because work gives people meaning in this world. Right. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice if everybody could just stay working as long as they wanted. But what we know is, is there was an Urban Institute study that really broke down the data that came out at the end of last year. And basically found that the majority of people over the age of 50 will eventually be involuntarily separated from their jobs. And when that happens, they will probably never re achieve the same earnings potential again. So having this bulk of retirement savings and earlier rather than later is an incredibly good thing if you could afford to do it. You know, the time and compound interest, not that it's a guarantee, but so far it seems to work because, you know, you might think you can double the amount of savings you do in your mid 40s or early 50s, but you could be wrong and then it's going to be too late to do much any of anything about it. I mean, so that's really my major thought. It's less about emergency savings and more about trying to put away long term savings is what I would say. That is so important to touch on. And now, Helene, I'm going to challenge you here. Mm -hmm. Do you want to try and explain what compound interest is to someone who doesn't have a financial background? Well, let me try. Um, <laughs> compound interest is essentially the idea that money grows on money. So if you put $10 away one year and it grows at 10%, the next year you have $11. And then that $11 grows at 10% and you have a, you know an extra dollar, a dollar ten, and so on down the line. And the, er longer you, the earlier you do this, this, the more money you will have over time. Um, that's how it works. Ultimately, if you say start saving in your early 20s versus say your early 60s, you have to put aside a lot less money in your early 20s to have the same amount of money at the age of 70 because of the value of compound interest over time. The amounts you have to put in beginning in your mid 40s, to, if you've never saved a penny for retirement to ensure an adequate retirement are almost absurd. I mean, it's literally like 40 to 50 percent of your take home. And unfortunately, it happens to a lot of people. Yes, it does. Because, again, it's really hard to get that money aside in the first place. And also, again, a lot of people don't have access to retirement accounts at work, or they just think, you know, I can deal with that later. Again, human nature. Most of us are sort of wired to think that way. Um, one of the great things in life you will discover is no one ever believes they're going to get old. Having that long-term, you know, behavior checking, macro vision and view of the financial picture and, and really thinking hard about the behaviors that you live day to day, today, in order to set yourself up, hopefully, for a more financially secure future. That and we really need health care reform in this country. I guess that would be the other thing I'd say take away. That'll save your finances a lot.
Yeah, because keep in mind, by the way, it's not just you. It's your parents, right? Like, if they run out of money, it's on you. I mean, nobody's leaving their parents to eat cat food. Yes, we've we've talked a lot, Katie and I, about the sandwich generation. I'm a, a few yes. years older than Katie. Yeah, you know, we're, we're that generation of maybe having to care for young children and aging parents at the same time. And if that's not the candle burning at both ends, I don't know what is. You know, you read these personal finance books and it says, you know, go talk to your parents about money, right? The, the one time I tried to talk to my mother about this stuff, she accused me of wanting her dad. Like, and, and the fact of the matter is, and it, you're very limited in what you what you can do ultimately. You know, so it's very actually hard to prepare for a potential expense from your elderly parents. I think we got a lot out of this and, you know, it was great to hear your perspective on a lot of different topics. Thank you so much. Back in 2013, in an interview with Helene Olin, Harold Pollack explained the best personal finance advice can fit on an index card. This went viral and he ended up creating the best personal finance advice on an actual index card. After that card went viral, Pollock and Olin wrote their book, The Index Card, in which they expand on the simple financial advice recorded on the index card. Here are Pollock's nine personal finance tips from his original index card. One, max your 401k or equivalent employee contribution. Two, buy inexpensive, well-diversified mutual funds, such as Vanguard Target 20XX funds. Three, Never buy or sell an individual security. The person on the other side of the table knows more than you do about this stuff. Four, save 20% of your money. Five, pay your credit card balance in full every month. Six, maximize tax advantage savings vehicles like Roth, SEP, and 529 accounts. Seven, pay attention to fees. Avoid actively managed accounts. Eight, make financial advisors commit to the fiduciary standard. Nine, Promote social insurance programs to help people when things go wrong. You've been listening to The 411K. Tune in for more podcasts and follow us on Instagram at the underscore 411K. Cheers.